Ladies and gentlemen, the end is nigh. The year is 1844, and the world will come to its violent end on October 22nd. Yet, on October 23rd, we were all still here. Let's explore William Miller's prediction on today's footnoting history. Hey footnoters, it's Josh with another intriguing religious tale for you in this episode. I really appreciated the feedback I received on my first go-round, so I'm excited to be back for a second helping of storytelling. When I first heard about William Miller and his predictions about the end of the world, his story captivated me immediately. Quite honestly, I thought it was downright hilarious that these people in upstate New York fervently believed that the end of the world would happen on October 22nd, 1844, and then woke up on October 23rd so despondent that it became known as the Great Disappointment. I imagined these people crying their eyes out, moping around, screaming, Why am I not dead and in heaven? And because I was a somewhat less mature man at the time, it really gave me the giggles. Now, I've grown a bit as a person since then, and I find Miller's story so captivating because of what it can tell us about the power of religious expectation in the United States during a time when Americans desperately wanted something reliable and reassuring during a time of tremendous social and cultural upheaval in the United States, the Industrial Revolution. So before we get to Miller himself, let's set the stage a bit and explore why Americans, especially Americans in upstate New York, might be attracted to what we might see as desperate and delusional. The beginning of the 19th century in the United States was a time of great upheaval and change. Everywhere Americans looked, this massive change confronted them. The size of the country had doubled under the presidency of Thomas Jefferson when he purchased the Louisiana Territory from Napoleon of France. Americans had gone to war with Britain again in 1812. Andrew Jackson charged John Quincy Adams was stealing the presidency with a corrupt bargain in 1824, after which Jackson upset the order of the American political universe by actually winning the presidency in 1828. More immediately to the average everyday American was the changing nature of the society around them, particularly the industrialization of work and the increasing urbanization around the growing nation. In upstate New York, evidence of this cataclysmic change in American society was perhaps best represented by the Erie Canal, a 363-mile man-made waterway that cut between the Hudson River at the east and what became Buffalo, New York in the west. So with all of this dramatic change in the United States, Americans looked for outlets to deal with the anxieties that all of this upheaval caused. Some turned to writing books by Pons in Massachusetts. Here's looking at you, Henry David Thoreau. Some jumped off waterfalls and dramatic showcases of skill and daring. Others still found comfort in playing what would become known as the national pastime, baseball. But when push comes to shove, when the world turns upside down and forces that seem beyond human control upend a way of living, human beings often turn to religion and their belief in a higher power. In the United States, of course, this meant turning to Christianity and a reliance on God to carry a person through these incredibly rough times. So as the United States' societies and cultures went through all of these really dramatic changes, American Christianity adapted in order to meet the needs of those seeking comfort in God Almighty. This wave of religious revivals in the United States has become known as the Second Great Awakening. Now, if you're wondering about why this is the second one, the first one happened right before 
the American Revolution and played a significant role in creating a separate, non-British identity among the American colonists. Now look, that's a dramatic simplification, but I hope you'll indulge me that much. The Second Great Awakening, much like the first one, also brought a wave of religious revivals. But whereas the First Great Awakening, and again, this is a simplification, put an emphasis on emotion and passion in the face of the cold and calculated reason of the so-called European Enlightenment, the Second Great Awakening focused on cultivating the personal morality of the individual. For the Second Great Awakening, the primary mode of religious thought was known as perfectionism. And perfectionism is a lot like it sounds. One must lead as perfect or sinless a life as possible. And what better life to model one's own on than on the life of Jesus Christ himself? But of course, trying to live a sinless life took an incredible amount of work. Human beings, according to Christian theology, are creatures of sin. So humans, as moral free agents, must combat this sinful nature and reform themselves. This religious attitude led to a massive growth in reform movements around the United States, including an anti-alcohol temperance movement, and most importantly, the abolition movement that sought to end slavery. This new religious impulse also brought out some, let's say, American eccentricities as well. Some Americans chose to retreat from society completely and form their own communities of perfection. My personal favorite of these groups was the community at Oneida in New York. You might know that name from the silverware in one of your kitchen drawers. But in the 19th century, Oneida was not known for their silverware, but their unique sexual practices. Maybe that's a future episode. Another new religious movement born out of the Second Great Awakening was the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, otherwise known as the Mormons, led by Joseph Smith. Part of Mormonism's appeal, at least at the beginning of the movement, was that the group admitted anybody and condemned the selfishness of the rich. It was a democratizing movement. This is all to say that the energy of the Second Great Awakening was powerful enough to spark all kinds of new religious ideas and movements throughout the United States. William Miller and his vision of the end fits right into this context. William Miller, though, was not always a religious man. In fact, early on in his life, he was an avowed skeptic. Miller held fast to a belief in deism, which stemmed from his readings of Voltaire, Thomas Paine, Ethan Allen, David Hume, and other philosophers. Miller's deism, though, was not really dogmatic. In fact, you might say that most American deists did not subscribe to a rigid deism at all. Instead, Miller's deism was more pragmatic. Entries in his journals describe a man who looked for predictability, assurance, and control over himself and the world around him. In line with this desire for known outcomes, Miller was even quite taken with astrology at the time. And Miller was no fan of Christianity before his conversion, and in fact had quite harsh things to say about the Bible. In outbursts of sarcastic wit, the future preacher of the end times declared that the Bible was too full of inconsistencies and contradictions to be taken seriously. He mocked family members for what he saw as their peculiar beliefs. I think we've all met a guy like this at some point in our lives. But Miller had a change of heart. And what changed Miller's heart was war. Miller joined the Vermont militia in 1810, and eventually became a captain in the regular army. He saw combat action in the War of 1812, 
In August of 1814, Miller led an infantry company at the Battle of Plattsburgh. It was the sights of that battle that caused Miller to really confront his own mortality, at least in part. But more striking than that battle was a wave of typhus that absolutely ravaged his family before he even saw combat. Typhus killed Miller's sister, Anna, and in 1812, killed his father. After retiring from the army, Miller returned home and took up farming. And it was during this time that he began to study the Bible in earnest. Now, from the outside, a concern with the imminent arrival of Jesus Christ and the end of the world seems like quite a leap for a man who just years before had invested so much of himself in critiquing Christianity through reason. But Miller's religious milieu was full of apocalyptic window dressing. The soon-to-be doomsday prophet had visited a Shaker community in his youth. The politics of the time, especially the politics surrounding the War of 1812, was infused with apocalyptic expectation, no matter the side. And then add in Miller's previous fascination with astrology and being able to predict outcomes, and the road to millennialism isn't miles away. Miller's study of the Bible turned towards the prophetic gradually. During that time, he kept his thoughts mostly private, and in these private moments, William Miller began to see patterns and symbols and divine figurative meanings in the words of the scripture. Eventually, he developed a system of 14 rules of interpretation, grounded in part in biblical literalism. Most importantly, Miller believed that every literal figure in the Bible also had a figurative meaning and should be used for prophecy. Practically, this meant that when reading more apocalyptic scriptures like Daniel, Isaiah, and Revelation, beasts and horns became empires and tyrants. Days became years, based on the interpretation of past biblical scholars. And the real world had enough apocalyptic-seeming events to really hammer this home. Napoleon had recently captured and imprisoned the Pope, but was then defeated at Waterloo. The Ottoman Empire seemed on the brink of a final defeat. In fact, a Millerite had predicted that the Ottoman Empire would end in August of 1840. All of these fit into Miller's system. And eventually, Miller predicted that the coming of Christ's kingdom would arrive at some point in 1843. Miller's prediction of the end really began with the prophetic book of Daniel, particularly chapter 2, in which Daniel interprets a dream had by the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. Nebi Chaz, that's what we'll call him, saw a statue made of five different materials, gold, silver, bronze, iron, and clay. In the dream, Nebi Chaz saw a rock cut out of a mountain crush this statue, and then the wind scatter the remnants of the statue as if it were nothing. The rock eventually became another mountain, a mountain that filled the whole earth. Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar that the statue in the dream represented the kingdoms of the earth, which would all fall away and become dust because of the rock. That rock represented God's kingdom on earth which would be the strongest and most enduring of them all. Daniel's interpretation of this dream has captivated the minds of Christian exegetes wanting to know about the end of the world for centuries. Combined with the reading of Revelation, the dream acts as a roadmap of history. All of the empires represented by the statue would have to pass away, before Jesus' return to establish his earthly kingdom. Based on further readings of Daniel's prophecies, most exegetes believed that the end of days would happen 2,300 years 
after the Persians restored exiled Jews to Jerusalem after their captivity in Babylon, which most believe to have happened in 457 BCE. So the math is simple here. If you subtract 457 from 2300, you get 1843. Miller put it in more complicated terms. Here's what he wrote. 2300 years from 457 years before Christ, Daniel's vision will end. 490 years from the same 457 BC, Christ was crucified and the 70 weeks ended. The fourth kingdom and the last of all earthly kingdoms was divided into two parts. The first began 158 years BC and lasted 666 years to the end of the pagan daily sacrifice abomination, which was 508 AD. The last number given in Daniel, 1335, carries us down to the resurrection and will end A.D. 1843. In this last number is included the reign of Antichrist, 1260 years beginning A.D. 598 and ending A.D. 1798. Also, the 1290 beginning A.D. 598 and ending A.D. 1798. The remaining 45 years are for the spread of the gospel, the resurrection of the two witnesses, the church to come out of the wilderness, the troublous times, the last great battle, the second coming of Christ to raise his people, and reign with them personally the 1,000 years following. Now, that's confusing. William Miller and his promoters recognized this, and they eventually had a visual aid to make this complicated system a bit more comprehensible. If you check the episode notes, you'll see a picture of the so-called Great Chart. That Great Chart lays it all out. It identifies the kingdoms that would rise and pass away, and it demonstrates the calculations that Miller used. It's really a terrifying visual, and I really want to put it in my office. Now, if you are wondering why the year 1798 was chosen as a major marker of time, I don't blame you, but I have an explanation here. Miller identified quote-unquote Papal Rome as the final earthly kingdom prior to the 45 years of preparation for Christ's return. And what happened in 1798? That's the year that Napoleon took the Pope captive. For Miller and others, this was the clearest sign that the kingdom of Papal Rome had come to an end. So yes, folks, according to William Miller, Napoleon was responsible for ushering in the second coming of Christ. I know fellow footnoting history host Christine is thrilled that Napoleon gets credit for something else. She's a big fan of all things Bonaparte, after all. Now this is all well and good, but how did Millerism become a thing? After all, William Miller is a rather obscure person from a really small town called Poldney, Vermont. It's right on the border with New York. It's a small town, even today. I looked on Google Maps. It doesn't even have a Walmart. Miller, despite reservations, but at the urging of people with whom he had shared his calculations, published a few pamphlets and lectures in Baptist newsletters. As people read his predictions and got caught up in the religious energy borne out by the Second Great Awakening, demand for Miller skyrocketed. He eventually joined a lecture circuit around upstate New York. Miller eventually attracted the attention of Joshua Himes, a minister from Boston, who reprinted Miller's writings and continued to publish the Doomsday Preacher's sermons and lectures. Himes was a very, very effective PR man for Miller, 
and brought his preaching and calculations to thousands, if not millions of people by 1842. But as 1843 approached, pressure grew on Miller to declare when precisely in 1843 the end would come. Miller demurred for a bit, but eventually he announced that the end would come sometime between March 21st, 1843 and March 21st, 1844. I'm yet to figure out why March 21st, the spring equinox, was such an important date, but if anybody knows, shoot us an email and give us the scoop. As March 21st, 1844, the end of Miller's range approached, excitement about the second advent reached a near fever pitch. Mainstream churches had started to ban Millerite meetings and even expelled those who were vocal supporters of Miller's ideas. And then the day came. And then the next day came. It was March 22nd, 1844, and Christ had not returned to establish his kingdom on earth. Some, disappointed by Christ's non-return, left the movement. Miller's detractors continued to mock him and his followers, now with more evidence that Miller's predictions were just quackery. But the movement recovered. Miller had said all along that his predictions could be off by weeks or months. Some argued that this was the quote-unquote tarrying time, the time that Christ, in his benevolence, would allow for others to change their hearts before his final return. During the summer of 1844, however, the ideas of Samuel S. Snow, who had recently joined the movement, began to take hold in the Millerite community. Snow believed that Miller had the date of 1843 incorrect, and Snow had been preaching that the final day would come on the 10th day of the 7th month in 1844. Converting from the Jewish calendar that they used, that meant October 22nd, 1844. The movers and shakers of Millerism tried to freeze Snow out for a while, but eventually, Snow got his ideas heard. And on October 3rd, 1844, William Miller himself endorsed Snow's ideas and agreed that the end would come that October 22nd. Of course, October 23rd, 1844 came, Christ did not return, and the world remained the same. There was no second advent. In the Millerite movement, October 22nd, 1844, became known as the Great Disappointment, an apt name considering how these people must have felt. The Baptist churches that housed most of the Millerite movement quickly moved to expel William Miller and his congregation from their buildings and ranks. Many people who had previously clung to the movement not only abandoned their apocalyptic beliefs, but Christianity altogether. For others, though, the movement continued, just in a different context. For some Millerites, the Second Advent had indeed happened, though it had come spiritually instead of physically. For these folks, they bought into the idea that they could now perform miracles, including the raising of the dead. Others still proposed that day, Jesus had entered into the sanctuary of heaven and shut the door of mercy. If one had not been saved before that date, it was now impossible to receive salvation. Miller himself seemed to have preached about the shut door before, but in the wake of October 22nd, Miller remained quiet. During his silence, the Miller movement continued to fracture, and new denominations formed. Miller eventually came out against the shut door, and under Joshua Heim's leadership, the movement reorganized as the Advent Christian Church, who believed in the Second Advent, but admitted that the 1844 date had been wrong. 
Others in the movement were not satisfied with the direction Miller had taken and formed their own denominations. Out of the great disappointment came two new denominations of Adventists that have quite a bit of visibility even in the 21st century, Jehovah's Witnesses and Seventh-day Adventists. William Miller himself died in 1849. By then, he had retired for the most part and had even published an apology for his predictions in 1845. I've always been taken with Christian prophets who assign a precise date to the end of the world. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, verse 36, Jesus tells his disciples, quote, But about that day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Yet that hasn't stopped men like William Miller from trying to divine the precise date of Christ's return. Even today, the predictions continue. In 2011, a man named Harold Camping predicted that the end of the world would come on May 21st of that year. I remember seeing ads for the date all over Honolulu, Hawaii, as I wound down my master's degree. Interestingly, after May 21st did not bring the end of the world, Camping revised his date to October 21st. And after that date, he stopped, largely because Harold Camping had a stroke. Even now, still others are predicting dates to come for when Christ will return. So before we dismiss William Miller as a curiosity not worthy of our consideration, we might consider our own obsession with apocalypse, as it's borne out in our popular culture and even as we struggle with the consequences of COVID-19 in our world today. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Footnoting History. Don't forget to head over to footnotinghistory.com for visuals, links, and sources related to William Miller and the Great Disappointment. If you'd like to interact with us, we're on Twitter as at History Footnote, or Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest as at Footnoting History. We'd love to hear from you, and remember, the best stories are always in